Welcome to today's episode, where we look at supplements whose risks, according to clinical studies, outweigh the benefits. We start with direct antioxidants, specifically high-dose vitamins A, C, and E, taken post-workout. Training creates oxidative stress, which stimulates our bodies to work more efficiently, a positive effect. However, studies show that suppressing this oxidative stress with antioxidants may reduce the benefits of exercise. A randomized, placebo-controlled study in 54 healthy participants found that taking vitamins C and E reduced the beneficial effects of exercise. A systematic review in 2022 also showed that vitamins and minerals have no benefit in reducing rates of cancer or cardiovascular disease. The potential harm of direct antioxidants isn't just limited to exercise. There is evidence that vitamins A and E may increase mortality by disrupting the balance between oxidants and antioxidants. There is also evidence that vitamin A may increase the risk of lung cancer. Another often misunderstood topic is vitamin E. It consists of eight components, four tocopherols and four tocotrienols. There is often confusion on social media with claims that only alpha tocopherol is harmful, while tocotrienols are not a problem. But the safety concerns apply to the entire vitamin E complex, not just alpha tocopherol. We currently do not have long-term safety research on tocotrienol supplementation and therefore cannot definitively say whether they are safe or harmful. According to the Cosmos Mind study, proper micronutrient levels can improve cognition. To avoid confusion, we've talked about direct antioxidants so far. However, Indirect antioxidants like glycine and NAC are a different story. As we age, a powerful and naturally occurring antioxidant called glutathione appears to decline rapidly starting around age 45. By supplementing with the building blocks of glutathione, i.e. NAC and glycine, we can support our glutathione levels. The small randomized controlled trials available to date show that this strategy corrects glutathione deficiencies and supports mitochondrial function. We're still in the early stages of researching this strategy, but I wanted to highlight the difference between direct antioxidants, such as vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E, and indirect antioxidants, which support glutathione. The second group of supplements we'll discuss here are anti-inflammatories, especially post-workout. Examples of this are diclofenac, ibuprofen, or Voltaren. There are also anti-inflammatory supplements, such as coenzyme Q10 and pyroloquinoline quinone. When we exercise, we not only release a lot of oxidants, but we also inflame the body. And we don't want to disrupt this process, but instead signal to the body that it needs to become more efficient. A randomized controlled study shows that supplementation with coenzyme Q10 reduces the positive effects of training. There is also no good evidence for the benefits of CoQ10. It has not been shown to be valuable in treating cancer. Some studies have examined whether coenzyme Q10 might be helpful in preventing heart disease, but the results are inconclusive and show no significant effect on blood pressure. Additionally, there is good evidence that patients taking statin medications do not experience any additional benefits from CoQ10. Third on the list is resveratrol. Overall, there is no good evidence that resveratrol provides any benefits to mice or humans. But we have great evidence that resveratrol again reduces the positive effects of exercise. Several studies show this. Resveratrol also lowers testosterone levels, so it also has harmful effects. Fourth on our list is metformin, but not for diabetics. Although it is not a dietary supplement, many people focused on longevity take metformin for its perceived health benefits. To be clear, Hardly a day goes by in our clinics when metformin is not prescribed for pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetic patients. The positive evidence for this patient group is overwhelming. However, here we're talking about non-diabetics taking metformin. We have impressive evidence from the Diabetes Prevention Program in which over 3,000 non-diabetic adults were followed over a period of 21 years. Half of the participants took a placebo and half took metformin, and overall there was no difference in rates of death, cancer, or cardiovascular disease. And just like with resveratrol, we have evidence of potential harm. In several studies, metformin reduces the positive effects of training by around 50%. It also lowers testosterone levels, just like resveratrol. The fifth supplement to avoid is iron. 
We're including this one because if you look at Google's trends, iron is an incredibly popular supplement worldwide, probably because when people feel tired or exhausted, they think they may have low iron levels and immediately start supplementing iron. If you have measured your iron levels with a blood test and they are low, then supplementing with iron is probably a good idea too. However, here we are talking about people who simply blindly take iron supplements. We know that iron supplements can interfere with zinc absorption. People can also develop inflammation of the stomach or gastritis and stomach lesions. There was also an interesting study that came out that involved almost 50,000 people and found that people with higher iron levels seem to have a shorter life expectancy. There is also the idea that lower iron levels may contribute to why women live longer than men, as women generally have lower iron levels due to monthly bleeding. Could this contribute to life expectancy? An interesting thought, and if applicable, also a nice example of the fact that more doesn't always help, but rather actually does harm. Sixth on our list are calcium supplements, which are also very popular. Some people, such as vegans or those who do not consume dairy products, may need them. But many people take calcium supplements to strengthen their bones. However, current research shows that calcium combined with vitamin D does not prevent fractures. Instead, there is evidence that calcium supplements could promote the formation of kidney stones. The possibility of calcium deposition in our blood vessels is also discussed. The final verdict is still pending. An expert panel convened by the National Osteoporosis Foundation and the American Society for Preventive Cardiology concluded that calcium, whether from foods or supplements, neither increases nor decreases the risk of heart attacks. However, if our diet is already balanced and we get enough calcium, taking extra is unlikely to provide any benefit but could cause harm. Seventh on our list is high-dose folic acid. To avoid misunderstandings, I am not referring to pregnant women here. Aside from this particular group, there are concerns that high folic acid intake could accelerate the progression of cancer lesions. There is also evidence that it may negatively impact the immune system and contribute to cognitive impairment in older adults. In eighth place is high-dose niacin, a form of vitamin B3. Other forms of vitamin B3 include nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, nicotinamide riboside, NR, and nicotinamide. We have convincing evidence from a 2018 meta-analysis that high-dose niacin is associated with an approximately 10% increased risk of all causes of death. It also appears to cause new cases of diabetes and serious disruptions in blood sugar control. It appears to increase serious infections as well as bleeding. And regarding the other forms of vitamin B3, NMN, NR, and nicotinamide, all of these forms are converted into niacin by the intestinal bacteria in mice and then absorbed. While we don't have the human research to know exactly how these different forms of vitamin B3 are absorbed, there is a strong possibility that they are first converted into niacin and then absorbed. The recommended daily dose of vitamin B3 is only 16 milligrams, but you will see people in the longevity range taking orders of magnitude higher than that up to a gram or a gram and a half per day. The last group of supplements that we cannot recommend are fat-burning supplements. Most of the time it's caffeine and you can get all the caffeine you want from coffee. If you drink one to two cups of coffee within three hours of waking up, that's perfect. That's all you need. So save your money for the fat-burning drugs. Hopefully you recognize the theme of this video. There are many nutritional supplements that are completely unnecessary. If we boil it down to the essentials that really help us, then keep it simple. Diet, exercise, sleep, positive attitude towards life and social contacts. There are a few supplements that have good evidence, such as creatine for muscle performance, vitamin D in the deficiency months, and omega-3 for reducing the risk of heart attacks. But they are the icing on top of an already great lifestyle. That's it for today's episode. We hope there was something educational for you. And as always, we wish everyone a long, healthy, and happy life. Until next time.